Hi, and welcome back to David Pattinson's Accused Friends podcast format. Today I want to talk about the virus of wealth transfer that's uh, emanated out of the lockdown status that we've been in over uh, almost 12 months now. You will have noticed that um, a lot of businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, local businesses have had to shut their doors to, um, you know, protect us against the virus, to protect each other, to protect the NHS. But big business has been allowed to um, continue, uh, dominate the market because they're picking up a much greater market share now than they were. And um, they've also been able to grow uh, big business through the stock market. And I want to talk a little bit about how this process has uh, come about in this podcast. So you will have noticed that um, despite the fact that we've been on a worldwide lockdown in, in many countries, some more than others, ours more than, than pretty much every other country, the stock market, um, you know, initially crashed, but has then bounced right back. And it's bounced back through uh, government stimulus. And what's happened is that you've had big corporations um, big corporate titans, you know, publicly saying, you know, we love the lockdown, we love masks, we love social distancing, we love small business closing down, you know, we're doing our best to pick up the slack. Uh, and, and then behind the scenes, they're advising government that, uh, you know, government, you need to stimulate the economy, you need to um, bail people out, you need to uh, keep liquidity running through the system. Um, you know, the bank, big banks have uh, pushed this as well. And um, that money uh, ends up in, in the stock market. It ends up, um, you know, boosting the, the shares and the, uh, the stock prices of big business. So if you're a, a stockholder, if you own a portfolio of shares, you're making more and more money. If you are not an owner of shares, you're getting the cost. And um, the cost is put on the future. It's put on future generations. It's put on future workers. So we're stealing money from the future to benefit the present in who own stocks and shares, who own big business. And um, this, to me, is a major, major crime against, um, you know, the British people. And it's something that needs to be looked into. Uh, the government, of course, is facilitating this wealth transfer to benefit them. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship. Big business, um, big owners of uh, stocks and shares, you know, make out like bandits. And government benefit through, you know, greater government power, greater government tyranny. And um, you'll have probably noticed this phrase back, you know, when I was younger, there was these previous sort of emergencies like September 11th or, or the 2008 financial crisis. And this phrase always popped up around these times, which was never let a good crisis go to waste. It's like, look, David, there's this big crisis. We're the government, we're not going to let it go to waste, which is code for we're going to use this crisis to benefit us. And I think over time, government has learned that rather than wait, sit around waiting for the crisis to occur, let's just create the crisis in the first place. Let's manufacture a crisis so that we can then not let that crisis go to waste, so that we can then benefit from it. And there's been, over the course of the last... 30 years, I would say, a big um, consolidation of the two-party system of big business and big media. It's a sort of triumvirate. And uh, in the latter part of this 30-year period, big tech has joined that group, uh, kind of on the big media side. Big media used to be cable news and, um, you know, the newspapers, and now big tech is sort of the, the overseer of that group. Uh, the two-party system has merged to become one-party government, and obviously big business has, um, you know, wanted to, to become wedded to this group uh, to benefit them. Um, and I call this system a crony capitalism. It's, it's not capitalism on merit, it's capitalists 
getting a market advantage via the unique relationship they had to have to government. Government gives them special privileges uh, that they don't give to, um, you know, smaller, smaller businesses or other businesses or other people. And so they're able to, uh, you know, earn super normal profits, which is a, a phrase used in uh, in economics, uh, which I learned, um, you know, back when I was studying economics at university. So crony capitalism is the problem. Um, and, you know, you'd have noticed this through the lockdown, you know, Sainsbury's, Tesco stay open, there's no one spreading the virus there. But, you know, Jim's market stall has to close because, you know, he might be spreading the virus uh, through his through his fruit and through his vegetables. So total blatant double standard. You notice this manipulation, I think, quite a lot through uh, ex-prime ministers or ex-presidents. I mean, this phenomenon has come out of America. Britain has picked it up from America. It started in the Clinton era. Um, you know, Bill Clinton, New, New Democrats, and uh, Tony Blair followed this theme with, with New Labour, which was everything you liked about old Labour, but, you know, everything you hated about old Labour, you don't have to worry about that because this was New Labour. Then in the early 2000s, it was George Bush with compassionate conservatism, which meant that, you know, he was a con conservative who cared as opposed to conservatives who did not care, which was kind of everyone that had gone before him. David Cameron followed this up and, um, you know, pretty much adopted the Tony Blair New Labour strategy. I mean, it was New Labour led by David Cameron as opposed to New Labour led by um, Tony Blair and, and Gordon Brown. And, um, you know, these ex-prime ministers or ex-presidents then uh, leave office they posture as um, representatives of the people, which the people always saw them to be. But of course, now they're um, spokesmen for big business. Now they are um, have entities where, I mean, they're basically clients of big business. They're doing the bidding of big business in government and taking massive, massive fees. I mean, the Clintons have made hundreds of millions since uh, the year 2000. Tony Blair has made millions and millions. The Bushes and the um, Camerons are, um, you know, not quite on that level, but they follow the template. They agree with the uh, premise, you know, why do we let the people um, you know, make the rules, uh, direct us, why don't we direct them? Why don't we work to keep big uh, big government big, keep the two-party system um, in place, and uh, just have one one-party government? So it doesn't really matter who the people choose to be their elected representatives, you know, the policies are going to stay the same. We're going to have big government, we're going to have high taxation, we're going to have runaway debt, we're going to have the fraud of, of global warming and foreign aid. And, um, you know, we're going to cover it up through race wars, through gender wars and um, government through uh, what I call the government by permanent state of emergency. So you've got permanent emergency and that justifies, um, you know, permanent big government, permanent intrusion into people's lives, suppression of democracy, uh, suppression of civil liberties and the constant and growing encroachment of government in uh, every single aspect of your life. Um, so I think it's worth someone looking into all these big businesses, how their share prices have uh, jumped, especially these big corporate leaders, Bezos, Bill Gates, um, you know, Cook at Apple. Who, how much money have these people made through the coronavirus crisis? What about the big banks? Um, I can't think of too many of the um, these bank leaders off the top of my head, but Goldman Sachs, uh, J.P. Morgan, um, you know, Jamie Jamie Dimon, uh, wherever he is. How much money has he made through this crisis? I wonder. We need to be looking at how we keep pursuing these big government policies which are really all about big business, crony capitalist policies. And I wanted to move on now to how this is sort of 
um, permeating into the next phase of the um, the lockdown or, or the coronavirus quote unquote crisis. And this is to do with vaccines and health passports. And of course, vaccines were sort of billed as the solution to the manufactured crisis. You gin up the uh, the coronavirus, which was not that serious. You make every death a coronavirus death. Uh, whether it was a coronavirus death or not. And of course, the government is always the, the judge and the jury. The government dictates who has the virus, whether your test is positive or negative. It also dictates whether a death was a virus a death or not a virus death. I mean, I talked about Captain Tom, who died a few days ago. He had the... he was... Um, seen as having the uh, coronavirus, tested positive for the coronavirus and then died 10 days later of pneumonia. So is he a coronavirus death, which of course in the statistics he is, or did he die of pneumonia? There was an article about Phil Spector of Beatles fame. He was the producer of uh, Let It Be and um, it said he died of the coronavirus and then it said he died of uh, something else and then it said on the death certificate that it wasn't clear how he died and this was all in one one news article but of course the headline was that he died of the virus but of course in the small print it was not clear how he died obviously it doesn't really matter now but my point is the government is always the determinant of, of coronavirus cases coronavirus deaths there is no independent um, insight into all this there's no independent autopsies on these virus deaths and so the, um, the government makes the uh, is able to manipulate the the data and then we um, they are able to promote the vaccines as the solution to the problem and of course the vaccines have to be paid for they have to be paid for, I guess, by the government. British government's ordered however many hundred million doses at however many hundred million or billions of pounds, which goes into the pocket of, um, you know, med medical companies that have come up with these vaccines, which is great for them. It's great for their, um, you know, political spokesmen like uh, Tony Blair and, and David Cameron and those kind of people. And... Um, the issue, of course, with the vaccines has been whether they need to be compulsory or whether they need to be voluntary. And, of course, legally speaking, the government can't really make them compulsory. But what corporations can do is they can say, well, we won't let you shop with us unless you've taken the vaccine. We won't let you, um, you know, visit our store unless you've taken the vaccine. And, of course, the small business gets wiped out. You can only shop with big business and so they make the rules and this has kind of reached a bit of a well e an even more dangerous level in my view with this health passport concept which is being pushed by tony blair he says we can't the world can't survive without health passports and the rationale is that you know if you want to travel anywhere you need to prove that you've taken the vaccine. You need to prove that you're COVID free. And of course, the government, like I just said, are the, the tester of, of, of first resort. They're the people that say whether you've got the, the, uh, the virus or not the virus. They're the people that can uh, green light your health passport or not or, or red light your health passport. Now, of course, like I was saying in one of my earlier videos, if you want to leave the country, you can leave the country. If you want to have freedom of movement, per the English Bill of Rights, you have freedom of movement. But of course, these health passports are a filter. And it's all done under the guise of, of healthy interaction, healthy, um, keeping everyone safe, everyone's going to be healthy. But of course, what about the nefarious purposes these health passports can be used for? Let's take a moment to think about the unintended consequences. What about if uh, you're someone that uh, is someone a little bit like David Pattinson who makes anti-lockdown content online? Do you think uh, my passport's going to get green-lighted? I don't think so. What about if you're someone that says you don't want the Premier League to constantly talking about racism before, during and every football match on TV? Do you think your health passport's going to be getting green-lighted? I don't think so. What about if you're a, you believe that the government is the supreme leader of the country, that you 
you wear Black Lives Matter logos on every item of clothing that you think big government only needs to get bigger. I'm pretty sure your pass your health passport is going to get green lighted. You're someone that believes in permanent government. Your passport will get green lighted. And uh, there was this story I was looking at about Greece. Uh, well, actually, it was about Britain, but it was it mentioned Greece in the, uh, in the story. I mean, it was saying that, you know, for example, a lot of British travellers, holiday makers in the summer like to go to Greece. They want to go to Greece this summer. So let's get ahead of the game because Greece might say, well, you know, we're only going to be accepting British tourists if they have the health passport. But of course, they haven't done yet. But we as Britain are going to get in ahead of the game and uh, get these health passports set up. So that if and when Greece want uh, British people to have the health passport, everything's good to go. But of course, why is it us that's doing this? In the article, it was saying how Greece makes nine billion a year out of British tourism. So we set up, we spend all the investment on the cost to benefit Greece, and then Greece is already making nine billion a year out of us anyway. Why don't Greece pick up the tab for this if they want it done? And of course, if Greece don't want it done, then what's it matter? I mean, Harry Maguire, the Manchester United captain, famously visited Greece last summer, and, uh, you know, he didn't really have any problems traveling there without a health passport. Obviously, the problems began for him once he'd arrived. But, um, you know, going back to my original point, we're promoting selling to benefit Greece, where we pay the cost. And, um, you know, Greece may or may not be interested. I mean, they're saying to themselves, hey, let's just get the nine bill from the British. Screw these health passports. The, the standard British passport will work for us. But of course, it's not about Greece. It's about the British government. It's about controlling the British people. It's about controlling movement. And it'll start with international travel. Then it'll go to domestic travel. If you want to get on the train to go into work, you know, your health passport has to green light you. But if you were at an anti-lockdown protest over the weekend, you won't be getting on the train. The health passport will be red. You won't be able to get on the tube. You won't be able to get on the bus. You know, you probably won't be able to start the engine of your car because the health passport's on red until the government say, you know, you're a good person, you're a good guy, you're not showing any small government tendencies, and, um, you know, this is the tyranny of health passports where we got to totally, totally reject it. Um, of course, none of these tyrannical systems could ever occur, well, without you know, manipulated media and uh, the sort of blanketing of information, uh, manipulated internet, manipulated social media, manipulated mainstream media, um, and of course also, most importantly, manipulated money. Uh, I've talked a lot about how, you know, we need to get totally away from manipulated money, how, you know, the government and, um, you know, the Bank of England and the Chancellor of the Exchequer can steal money from the future to prop up the present, to dole out the present, to strengthen big government today and dump the cost on, you know, young, be young people tomorrow or the unborn tomorrow. It's total criminality. It's total theft. It's total debt slavery. Um, you know, we need to get back to a gold standard where British people control their own money, where money is a store of value. It's not just, uh, you know, something where the value can be changed on the whim of, of the Chancellor. Uh, it cannot be inflated. And, um, you know, that is really where we need to get back to. We start with, mini with, with real money, as opposed to manipulated money. We then go to real news, real media, where the media are representative of the people. And then we go to real politicians, where, again, poli elected officials are representatives of the people. They are not representatives of big government and big business. So a lot of uh, damaging things going coming down the pike. We've got to be totally, totally against health passports. And, um, you know, we need to keep the pressure on speaking out against... Um, you know, government tyranny, the total violation of British civil liberties and abs the absolute fraud of um, the health crisis, which has perpetuated the virus of wealth transfer. So I hope you like this podcast. Please subscribe to the channel and we'll talk to you soon.